In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I just made it in the nick of time because in the USA, you had a, those of you who are listening from the USA, went through a daylight savings change, which we in Italy did not. We don't change the clocks for till the end of this month. And as a result, I almost missed the program thinking it was normally 6 p.m. here in Italy, but now it's 5 p.m. because of the daylight savings change. And I walked literally in the room of the monastery where I'm staying, and I saw that Radio Maria had texted me and I said, oh, oh, let me jump in the chair and get right on it. And that's what I did. So I'm not as prepared as I normally am because of this unexpected time change. But I can share with you some things that I have been preparing and that you are well aware of. Volume one, I'm in the mid middle of translating. And every page has a few footnotes, reasonably so, because of the necessity to qualify qualify Louise's Apollian expressions. Okay, some of the expressions she uses don't translate literally into the Italian. Okay, and uh, therefore, <clears throat> um, I have to go to the grammatic expressions in Apollian and in Italian. Now, Apollian's a dialect within the Italian. It's like a language within a language, right? and then extrapolate the intended meaning Louisa sought to convey. And this is easily explicated once you know Italian yourself, because you can compare by cross-referencing words that she uses in different contexts to understand what she's trying to convey. I'll give you an example. She uses the word confused, literally in Italian, which in English does not mean confused. When she uses the expression Mi sono sentita tutta confusa. I felt completely confused. She doesn't mean confused in English as we understand it, but she means either mortified or embarrassed. That's what she means. Now, I know the poor English translations that are presently in circulation don't have this proper translation. They have confused and it shouldn't be confused. That's just one of about, I'd say, 700 examples of words that she uses that are mistranslated in English. And that's just the beginning of the translating work that I'm doing. I'm also explaining the what's called Sitzenleben in German, which means the historical context of her day to better understand her expressions and why Jesus suffered in the way he did. Remember, Louisa went through a cholera epidemic, a first world war, a second world war, the Mm, apparitions of Fatima, Our Lady, warning the world about an impending war if Russia did not was not consecrated, and many other things she went through that are not in the volumes, per se. And in explaining her context historically, I also go into, for example, the location, not just the history. Case in point, Torre di Sperata. This is a place where Louisa began a new life. Those are her words in volume one. After the three year battle with demons from the age of 13 to 16, which petered out after about 18 months. So the intense attacks were only for a year and a half. Then the second 18 months, they continue to vex her, but not as often or as intense because she was trained by the master teacher, namely Jesus Christ on how to cast out demons and on how to get rid of all trouble, fear, and worry. So if you're ever wondering, after having suffered or continuing to suffer some 
setbacks psychologically, whether it's through depression or through regret, whatever, there's a way to overcome these. And Jesus gives us the method through Louisa. He tells her not only to how to cast out demons, but how to get rid of all fear, worry, and trouble. Okay. Um, I'll share with you also in talking about volume one, the context of Torre Disperata. Because after this three year battle with the demons, she says, La mia ho incominciato una nuova vita, nuova vita, a new life I began. And what is that new life? I won't talk about that now, but what I will talk about is the example I gave you of Torre Disperata. Okay, what is Torre Disperata, where her new life began? People think, okay, it was the place where she had the family farm. It's much more than that, okay? And by understanding this, you better understand what the new life was about that she began to experience there, okay? So what I do is I add footnotes explaining all this in detail. I'll share one with you. Torre disperata, literally in Italian, torre means tower. Disperata means despair. So why is this place where she had, her parents had a country house, house called Tower of Desperation? Well, there is no tower there. Rather, it was referred to as the tower because it's the highest point in the whole Murgia Plateau in Puglia. Puglia is the province in which Italy, Luisa was born. I'm sorry, the region was Puglia, the province was Bari, and the city was Corato. So sort of like, take for example, I don't know, California, you can say Los Angeles, the biggest city in the United States. I think Jacksonville, Florida is right behind that by a, a hectare or just over an acre. All right, that's a city. But within the city, you have towns, right? You have Beverly Hills, you have Bel Air. That's all within Los Angeles. And then outside of LA, you have the state, California. Well, similarly, Puglia was a region, like what we call us, something like a state, but it's, yeah, something like that. And then within that, you had a province, which we would call um, a city, like Los, I'm sorry, a town or a hamlet. And then within that, you might have like a, a village, okay? So she was in this area called Puglia. Puglia is the region, it's like the whole state. And in Puglia, there was a plateau, the highest point in Puglia, in the Murgi area. And that was a mile and a half high, higher than Denver, Colorado, right? 8,809 feet high. In meters, 2,685 meters high. So it was the highest point. And this is very symbolic because whenever Jesus or any of the prophets prayed, they went up to the mountain, Moses, right? Jesus Christ on Mount Transfigured, Mount Tabor. Always a place of communication with God, the highest point. And this is where Louisa began her new life. You see the, you see the parallel? God meant for her to be there. And this Torre di Sperato was located about 27 kilometers, which is about 16 and a half miles from her home in Corato. And this farm was previously called, before it was called Torre di Sperato, Conca d'Oro. Conca is like a, like a, um, a shell, it's a crescent, crescent shape. Now it's rectangular, it's, times have changed. But back in the day of Luisa, this had a crescent shape to it. And Doro is, means of gold was the name given to it previously because of the rich grain harvest in Puglia. And the gold was the reflection of this sun rays off of the grain. The golden grains reflecting the sun's rays. Conca because of the crescent shape of, crescent shape of that area. Whenever I say certain words, sometimes it's, I get tongue tied like unfathomable, fathomable, something, <laughs> or like enmity or amenity. Some of these words, I don't know who made them in English, but they, they are derivatives of Latin and German. And crescent, it has an SC. Now in Italian, that's a sh. That's why I'm saying crescent, because in Italian you would say sh for SC. In English, it's sh. so crescent shape. All right. And what happened was, on account of the great drought that left that area before Louisa's time quite barren, farmers 
agriculture is called, began referring to it as the highest point, hence the word torre. They were not very educated, remember back then. Even Louise is an example. Most children of her day did not go beyond elementary school. They were all workers in the fields. So they would call it the tower. That was a simple way of saying the highest point. And it was in desperate need of crops because of the drought, hence the word disperata. Torre disperata. Now you know the historical context, you see. You probably never heard that before. So this is the where Louisa's new life began, and God wanted it there because of the elevation. It was not a peak, but rather Torre Disperato was the highest point of a series of soft ripples of elevated land, a mile and a half above sea level. All right. So having shared that, I'll share a little passage of what I've translated thus far. And it's turning out to be very well. I thank you all for your prayers. This is coming through well. And by the way, some people have asked, you know, about translating and all that. Always before I do anything, I always request permission. And I did that. And as I shared with you before, in previous broadcasts, there was the printing press in Italy, northern Italy. In fact, I visited them two days ago. They have all of Louise's volumes and the originals, right? Why do they have them? Because before the Archbishop Giovanni Battista Picchieri received the copyright ownership of Louise's works, who owned it? this printing press. So they have all the originals. They gave them to the archdiocese. The archdiocese didn't get them from Louisa. <laughs> they got them from this printing press. And Archbishop Giovanni Battista Picchieri gave permission to this company in Italy to print all of her volumes in Italian, and they've done so. There's no moratorium on the printing of her writings in Italian. They, they have written permission from the archdiocese. And so they published all 36 volumes. Now they sent me all of these years ago when I was, well, let me rephrase that. When I was in Italy in the early nineties, I went to see them. And that's when I received all these volumes, okay? I didn't say a word to anyone because at the time they didn't want me to let others on. But then when I went back to America, they shipped the hard copies when they were all published to my place in the US. But since I did not bring all 36 volume hard copies with me, I said, let me take a ride there and grab to pick up another series of copies. And that's what I did for the, for the translations, okay? So what I'm saying is the archdiocese received all the copyright permissions from this printing press. But the printing press made a caveat in the contract that they gave a copy to me of. I have all the paperwork, by the way, if people are wondering. So I know exactly who has copyrights and who has permission to print I'm, because I, I was involved in the process. And this printing press informed me, obviously. Now, it was previously owned by Andrea Magnifico. Andrew, his last name was Magnificent. What an irony. And he was given all of Louise's writings and copyright permission, three copyright permissions of printing, publishing, and profiting from Louise's three heirs. Okay, she was succeeded in death by three of her heirs. And they, by Italian law, have automatic copyright authority. Well, this, these three heirs gave all the copyright authority to this printing press run by Andrea Magnifico. Before he passed away, well, let me go back a step. While he was president of this printing press, he had a vice president named Francesco Gamba, who's still alive. And before Andrea Magnifico passed away, he gave all the authority of the printing press to Francesco. Now Francesco is the president, you see, and Francesco has, has this copyright permission. And he's the one in, with Andrea that shared it with the archdiocese. But the caveat they included in this agreement to give the copyright authority to the archdiocese was that they, this printing press, the only printing press that has permission to do this, would be of supporto essenziale, essential support in the diffusion of the new, let's say, um, published works through the archdiocese. So the archdiocese 
puts out, let's say, Louisa's works, right? They're not going to do that for a while because of what's going on with the cause right now. But um, when they do, this printing press will be involved because it's in the contract, okay? So I spoke with them and they said, yeah, translate. They, they said, it's fine. So I'm, that's, that's a good thing. I always get permission in advance. But my point is this. The devil knows how much these writings will destroy his kingdom. He knows that. So you can bet your bottom dollar that he's going to attack anyone who wants to get these writings out. And it's no coincidence that recently somebody distributed a false uh, statement about um, me, about people saying, oh, Father Joseph doesn't have this authority in this, which is silly because I have all the documents to prove it and I have my doctoral dissertation to prove it and the University of, <laughs> of Italy, a pontifical right that says so, and my superiors who back me. So the whole thing is, is silly in the sense that I don't get involved with these petty arguments because I know who's behind it. It's the evil one. And he uses people and sometimes the people are not aware of it themselves. Yes, they feed into their own, what do you want to call it, imperfections or pride, what have you. But this is why I say I'm grateful to you for your prayers because your prayers are enabling me to move forward, notwithstanding what's going to, what has happened and what's going to happen. I know he's going to pull out more of his cards, the evil one, to do something else in the near future. But as long as I keep focused on the, the goal and as long as I remain loyal, as Jesus told Louisa to be in volume one, to her daily prayers, then nothing will, nothing will uh, change. Louisa had an itinerary of prayer every day. And this is what Jesus told her would help her get through this one and a half year of battling with the demons. All right. So she, um, I'll have to go back in my translation that I'm looking at now. I put a footnote on what she was doing at the time when Jesus told her to remain faithful to her daily prayers. And I listed everything she did every day, which has not been done before. So you see, this translation is not just a translation. It goes into every detail of Louisa's life and every experience she had. And I even extrapolate a chronological time sequence of what age this happened and that happened. Because in volume one, she doesn't write it chronologically in age sequence. She does not. She goes back and forth. In the footnotes, I capture every event and apply it to an age. So we know how old she was when she experienced this or that. But back to her daily prayers. Let me see if I can find that and share it with you. Yes. All right. Jesus tells her, this is in volume one. What I ask of you, Louisa, is steadfast prayer. Even if you should suffer the pains of death, you must never neglect your daily prayers, that which you are accustomed to doing. The more you find yourself in the state of interior darkness, the more you ought to invoke the help of the one who can free you, which is Jesus. What is more, I want you to place yourself blindly in the hands of the confessor without examining what he tells you. For you will be surrounded by darkness and will be like one who without eyes needs a hand to guide her. Your spiritual eyes will be, the, will be, per, will be perceiving things through the voice of the confessor. Which like light will enlighten the darkness about you. The works of your hands will be directed by the virtue of obedience which will act as your guide, sustain you, and make you arrive safely at bay. Now, what were her daily prayers? And this is in the footnote, and I'll read it to you. Louisa would eventually attain, oops, that's, see, that's my alarm to get ready for Radio Maria because of the time change, you see. One second, let me shut it off. Louisa would eventually attain the state, spiritual state where she would no longer lose her peace. But in her exposure to the demons and her lack of familiarity with how to overcome them, she often did lose her peace. And Jesus would insist 
time and again, very patiently, that she'd not do that. And eventually it took her a while to come around, about a year and a half, for her to finally know how to deal with the demons and not lose her peace. So for about a year and a half, she was losing her peace on and off. And Jesus would also reveal to her, and I'll quote to you here, he would later reveal to her, since, uh, let's see, She writes here on, this is in volume three, June 17th, 1900. Since blessed Jesus was not coming this morning, I felt some shadows of disturbance arise in my interior on account of it. So when he came, he said to me, my daughter, to contain oneself within God and to go out of the boundaries of peace is one and the same thing. And not to go out of the boundaries of peace is one and the same thing. So if you detect a little bit of disturbance, it is a sign that you are making a little exit from within God. Because to contain oneself within him and not have perfect peace is impossible. Okay. He tells her the same thing in volume four, November 2nd, 1900, February 13th, 1923, volume 15. So what I do in this footnote, I bring all these volumes together to show how when she loses her peace, it's her fault. And that Jesus has been constantly counseling her not to do so. But this is, again, not a deliberate fault. It's a, it's a question of her, in part, adolescent immaturity and also unfamiliarity with how to overcome the demons. Because she, they were putting in her thoughts that Jesus would abandon her. And that made her lose her peace. And she believed them. That's, that was part of the problem. Um, but her daily prayers included pious exercises that in, that... Um, began with um, meditating upon the infant Jesus in the Blessed Mother's womb. This is found in volume one, number three. Now, what I do in this volume, I translate it exactly as the notebook is written, which you do not have in English right now. The actual volumes had someone, it was not Louisa, and it was not a priest. I could tell by the incorrect theology, put subtitles throughout volume one to different events in Louisa's life. It is, it was in a dark red calligraphy ink. So I have corrected those subtitles to match the exact events and the, and the theology and to correct the theology. So when you do have this, um, it will be very explanatory in that sense. So when I say volume one, number three, that's the number three that was put in there by someone in the volumes and that I also report in this translation, but that I correct theologically, okay? So she began to meditate um, on Jesus in the Blessed Mother's womb. That was how she started to meditate. That was the first thing. Then she began to meditate on the Holy Family's life in the house of Nazareth. That was the second daily prayer she incorporated in her life in this order. The third thing she then began to do every day was to see God in all things, the sun, the moon, the stars. The fourth, she started to, at the request of Jesus, do acts of humility. And what she refers to as an annihilation, self-annihilation. And I explain what that self-annihilation is because this is a a word that also John of the Cross used. So you have to understand what it is. It's basically, to put it in a nutshell, and being aware of or entering within the awareness of one's own nothingness before the creator. When I say nothingness, what does that mean? That your soul has no value? Of course not. When you acknowledge that you are literally from dust, you did not exist before you were conceived, That's when you begin to enter your nothingness because you acknowledge yourself for what you are. And in so doing, acknowledge God for all that he is in you. You see? So in order to appreciate what you have, you have to acknowledge that it all comes from God only. Nothing comes from you. That's entering within your nothingness. And Louisa would have a technique in which she did this. And I go into explaining that as well later. The next thing she practiced every day, she incorporated in her daily prayers was frequent sacramental confession. Now this wasn't daily, this was about weekly. And acts of gratitude 
and charity and a spirit of sacrifice. The next was compliance with the confessor's counsel. She struggled with this for a while because of her timidity. She did not always open up herself initially to the priest and Jesus got very seriously angry with her. She was a little bit frightened by his attitude. <laughs> you know, imagine being frightened by God when he's angry. And she, she straightened up real fast when he showed his, his, his displeasure with that because she would hide a few things from the confessor that she was embarrassed to say. But when she finally opened up, not only was it better for her because the confessor could then properly guide her, but Jesus was very pleased. And then after that, she began to meditate on the passion. The passion didn't come right away. It came later in life. In her teens still, nonetheless. Then she started to practice every day 33 visits to Jesus while offering him acts of adoration and reparation. When I say 33 visits to Jesus, I mean in the Blessed Sacrament. She would do this when she was able to walk. But when she lost the capacity to walk because of God's will, that she live completely on the Eucharist and on his will, and that she be 100% attentive to that. She then made these spiritual visits within her soul to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. 33 visits to honor the 33 years of his life on earth. All right, so that was her daily regimen of prayer. Um, now, I'm going to change the subject just briefly here. I talked about volume one on the fly, not expecting to do so. Now I'll talk to you about something I was working on in the last few days, including this morning in Italy. And that is on the course that I'm preparing for priests and laity to go out and teach the divine will to all the world by being faithful to sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium. This last part is what some people who are promoting the divine will do not wish to accept, the magisterium. There are promoters of the divine will, but they attack the magisterium. That includes the Roman pontiff and the bishops in communion with him. The Catholic encyclopedia, the Catholic catechism, and the code of canon law all state that those who act in this way are schismatics, have nothing to do with them. They are not promoting the will of God while attacking God's representatives. It's impossible. They are promoting the human will under the guise of the divine will. Let me make that very clear. Louisa would never adopt this approach and neither should we. Certainly certain people are out there trying to pander to an audience. I mean, let's be honest. We have three major Catholic Christian groups in the church. You have the largest, the Catholics, the second largest, the Protestants, and the third largest, the Orthodox. The Catholics and the Orthodox are 99% identical in doctrine. We all have seven valid sacraments. And the Protestants all stem from, of course, that 16th century uh, Roman uh, Protestant Reformation under Luther. And they branched out into several, I think it's over 2,000 denominations worldwide now. But we are all baptized and our baptisms are all valid in Christ. And that means we're all members of the same mystical body of Christ. Baptism admits us to the body of Christ, the family of Christ. So in that sense, we're all brothers in the Lord, although expressing our faith in different ways. If you look at the Protestant approach to evangelizing, they are not, the, the common practice is not for them to be ordained and sent out by, let's say, an, uh, an authority or a bishop. I know the Latter-day Saints have bishops, the church, the Mormons, but Cardinal Ratzinger wrote a document on that explaining how their baptism is not valid in many cases because they don't believe in the Trinity like the Christians do. They don't believe in one God and three distinct persons. They believe in three gods. That's the difference, you see. Nonetheless, getting back to my point, when a Protestant is preaching, they have to pretty much preach what their benefactors, audience, expect them to preach. Otherwise, they won't have them in the church. That's how it works. This approach, unfortunately, in my opinion, I say unfortunately, 
is creeping in to some divine will promoters. They're preaching to an audience that they think will be pleased by them saying what the audience wants. That is not how you preach the divine will. You don't pander to anyone when you preach the truth. You preach the truth in love, yes, as St. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, but you stand your ground, even if you're persecuted, that's preaching the truth. Unfortunately, you'll find in some of these groups, people promoting what the audience wants to hear. So you have the far right group and the far left group and divine, some divine will promoters pandering to these groups. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to fail miserably. You know why? Because these groups are not united with the magisterium. That's the problem. It's sort of like a branch connected to a tree that relieves its, receives its life source from the sap. But once that branch is severed, it looks good for a few weeks. It's still green, but give it a few months. Then it withers and dries and becomes dead. These groups appear to be alive right now, but they won't, they'll be dead eventually. Because once you cut yourself off from the life source, which is the church, and start attacking the magisterium, no, now you're in, you're, yeah, now you're in schism and you've cut yourself off, and that's how it's defined by the church, removing themselves from union with the magisterium with the papacy when the bishops in union with him. Naturally, you who know me know that not only am I Italian like Louisa and therefore stubborn, but I try to apply that stubbornness in a way like St. Paul. Well, not that he everything he did was, <laughs> was uh, the right approach. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, I don't know. But sometimes, you know, he almost got beat to death and was left lifeless because he, he stood his ground a little bit, you know, maybe too much in that way, I don't know. But some of the things, wherever Paul went, he always got in trouble practically, but he was preaching the truth, you see. And if you look at his epistles, you can see the progression of his virtues. He starts out with his first epistle, I, Paul, apostle appointed by Jesus Christ. His last epistle, Paul, unworthy apostle. And Louisa went through this, and we go through this progression as well. And when it comes to the divine will, those who start to promote it initially start out like that. You know, I am appointed to promote the divine will. And then as they go through life, they realize that, well, maybe I'm not appointed as I thought I was. <laughs> I'm nothing but a servant. I'm doing the Lord's bidding. And as Moses said, and as Jesus said, if they want to prophesy outside of the field, if they're not with the 70 elders and they still receive the gift of prophecy, let them prophesy. Or as Jesus said to John, the apostle, whoever is not with against me is with me. When they were also receiving the Holy Spirit, these other people that were not part of the group of the apostles. But the key is this. As long as they preach the truth and are united to the magisterium, let them all preach till their lungs die. That's what I say. But if they start attacking the magisterium, have nothing to do with these individuals. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, stay away from those who create trouble like this. Now, this course that I mentioned that I'm working on to help prepare people to go out and preach will follow a, a guideline similar to this. Now, I'm going to have two separate courses. One is for priests only, and one is for laity. And it should be that way because priests have a different formation than the laity naturally, and they are trained more than the laity in theology and, and doctrine. But we'll start, I start out with the three founts of the Catholic faith, sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and magisterial teaching. Most people, when they preach Louisa, start with Louisa. You can't really do that. You can mention her at the beginning, of course, but you have to first ground her, give her some base, foundation. And this is one of the big problems of people that promote Louisa who are not, let's say, delegated by the church or the university in Rome to teach or preach or even have the title theologian to do the same. They start out with Louisa and they don't go back to the foundations upon which her writings are established. 
2,000 years of Christian theology from the Greek patristic to the Latin scholastic to the present day resourcement are present and explicated in Louisa's writings. So Louisa doesn't have a rupture, but a continuity with scripture, tradition, and magisterial teaching. This is very important. And this has to be the, the, the bulwark, the foundation, the bedrock of all preaching. And of the many theologians that I will address in these lessons are those who really talked about the divine will and pro provided us with tremendous theological insights like Maximus the Confessor. He was the foremost exponent of the divine will. No, he did not have the gift naturally, but he spoke about it and he defended the truth from heresy. Remember the heresy of monothelitism? That Christ had only one will? Well, he denounced that sharply and Pope Martin supported him. And then of course there was that, that um, schism in the church where they had two popes at the same time and, and the list goes on. But Simeon, the new theologian is another one. And Thomas Aquinas, Eckhart von Hochleim, which is known as Meister Eckhart, St. Gregory Palamas, Jean Daniel, who is a cardinal, Urs von Balthasar is a cardinal, Karol Wojtyla, who is a pope, Joseph Ratzinger, who is a cardinal and pope, and others. I mention these theologians and I go into their writings to show how the divine will is properly understood. Because these theologians provide beautiful explications on how the human will and the divine will cooperate. Louisa was not a theologian, so she doesn't go into the theology much. She just reiterates what she experienced and what Jesus taught her. But if you're going to teach it, you have to be trained in some level of theology. You have to. I'm not saying you have to be a doctor or a master, no. And then we move on to public and prophetic or private revelation, the nature of the two, because there's no new public revelation after Christ. That's obvious enough. But what is revelation? So I go into the nature of revelation. Has it ended with Christ? And if it has not, then what do we call these post-biblical manifestations of Jesus and Mary that are approved by the church? Revelations, obviously. So revelation didn't end. But then what's the difference between public revelation and the present day revelation that's post-biblical? And that's what I go into. So I talk about Article 66 of the Catechism, John 16, 12. I go into the church's teachings by several popes in the Lateran Council, the Trent Council, Bonaventure, Thomas Aquinas, Melchior Cano, Joseph Ratzinger, René Laurentin, Franz Dijkamp, Pierre Andes, Karl Rahner, Yves Congar, Carlo Balik, Eugenio Valentini, and others. And I talk of the types of faith which one may adhere to concerning a post-biblical revelation like the writings of Louisa. You have divine faith, human faith, ecclesial faith, and dogmatic faith. There are different types. I explain the difference between all of these and which one the church embraces, okay? Then I talk about the nature and I instruct you on how to present the nature and the purpose of the church's official seals of approbation that are backed by canon law, which no one can change except the Holy See. And that Louise's writings enjoy. Several of them enjoy the imprimatur and heal up staff. This is important, you know? People just can't dismiss this. Even Pope Benedict the 14th made a statement about this, whose name was Prospero Lambertini, about how these seals have universal authority. So even though one bishop gives a seal, it doesn't mean it's restricted to his diocese. Anyone can put these in churches and they can be displayed in churches once they have these seals, okay? And after that, I, I then instruct on the ecclesially approved and post-biblical revelations of the servant of God, Luisa Picarata. Then I get into the, the guts of it, so to speak. There are four different aspects in her life that have to be addressed distinctly. Her life, that influenced her writings naturally. The writings themselves, the substance and the form thereof. Her doctrine that the writings contain, which is replete with patristic, scholastic, and resourcement theology. 2,000 years of theology explicated in her doctrine that is within the writings and for her spirituality. Louisa had her own spirituality. We are not to imitate Louisa's lifestyle. Let me repeat this. We, you and I, are not to imitate Louisa's lifestyle. If you did, you wouldn't work a day in your life outside of bed, would you? She was confined to bed, so don't try to imitate that. 
She lived only on the Eucharist except for certain cases where the bishop asked her to test her obedience to eat, which she did and recurgitated the food intact. Uh, you're not supposed to do that. But you should imitate her virtues, which are really the virtues of Christ, and her holiness, which is the virtue of the holiness of Christ and Mary. But you have your own spirituality. This is important. And this is what some books do not even mention at all that are on the divine will and published. They don't address this, and this is a huge gaping hole in the teachings of the divine will that have to be addressed. You have to pattern your life and your domestic responsibilities and God-given vocation in life, whether you're a spouse or a celibate or whatever, to the writings of Louisa. The writings are not supposed to impose upon your personal domestic responsibilities and obligations before God. They're supposed to enhance them. I've heard people erroneously teach, even priests. I've heard two priests erroneously preach this that have been promoting the divine will for years. Once you come across the writings of Louisa, Louisa you have to abandon your previous devotions. This is completely erroneous. Don't do it. It's wrong. It's harmful. Just read what St. Francis de Sales teaches about this. He's completely opposed to it, and so is the church. Rather, the divine will is just like sacred scripture. It does not do away with the Old Testament, but it perfects the old law. Did not Jesus say that? So who are these individuals? By what authority are they to tell you, stop doing these devotions and just focus on this is... Focus on Louisa. This is silly. This is harmful. It will go backwards spiritually. The divine will should be incorporated in what you are presently doing. It doesn't change what you're doing. It intensifies your love, attentiveness, fidelity toward God, and it increases your the horosity of your virtues. Yes, you may increase the quantity of your prayer life and even the quality. But you don't abandon your personal obligations, of course not. And unfortunately, this has happened. This has happened, and I've seen it, and I still see it happening throughout the world. People will abandon even their marriage, but their marriage in difficulty because of the divine will. This is not what you're supposed to do. And um, if you want to leave everything, and you can, you're not bound to a spouse, and that's different. If you want, like... Like, you know, the great saints did. They gave up, like Francis, everything they had to follow Christ. Oops, God bless them. That's wonderful. But they had no obligations at the time that they were bound to, you see. Then after that, after talking about Louisa's life, writings, doctrines, spirituality, then I teach about how to read and interpret. This is the most crucial part of the lessons. And I base my teachings on church teaching, the biblical pontifical commission on how to interpret the word of God and how you have to receive intellectual and spiritual formation both. Intellectual is not enough and spiritual it is not enough. You have to have both. And then I go into the historic critical method that Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger wrote extensively about when interpreting the word of God, as well as canonical exegesis and the analogy of faith. I'll explain all these terms, what they mean on a practical level and how you can apply them to your interpreting and understanding Louise's writings. And there are different methods of interpretation. For example, you have the literal, spiritual, moral, allegorical, and anagogical, five different methods of interpreting scripture. Venerable Bede was one of the great interpreters of the word of God, and so was Cardinal Ratzinger. So I apply their approach to Louise's writings because it's no different. It's the same source that's talking to us that talked in scripture through the holy sacred writers and that talked to us through Louisa in the divine will writings. This is how we are to promote the divine will, not as something that fell from the sky without any foundation. So there's an objective and subjective discernment process that goes on when interpreting. And there, here is where I bring in John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, and Hannibal di Francia. These were three great saints who gave us beautiful lessons on how to avoid the devil's 
deceptions when it comes to subjective discernment of a, in, of a passage we are seeking to interpret. Because the devil will be there. There's no question about it. You can't be completely free from him trying to get in the way and, and bother you. Yes, you can learn like Louisa did under Christ how to detect him so as to ignore him. But if you don't have those tools, you, you will eventually fall subject to his deceptions. I hate to say this, but it's a fact. Okay, I'm speaking as a person who's been preaching the divine will throughout the world for the past 30 years, just under 30 years. The majority, I know it sounds rough, but it has to be said because it's a fact. The majority of the people reading and interpreting Louise's writings are not doing it correctly. They're not. Some are, of course. I'd say two thirds are misinterpreting the writings and one third is properly interpreting it. So this is something that needs to be addressed. So what should I do? Some people say, well, that's not your job. Just let the church do it. Well, I say to these people, you're actually incorrect. Have you read the vocation and the duty of the theologian from the magisterium? Three documents on the vocation and duty of a theologian. One is to explicate and explain and teach and preach, not just the gospel, but all that which the church has approved, including Louise's writings that the church has approved. That is my job. So I don't have to wait for the church because I'm part of the church. That is my duty. It's my vocation. I'm part of the hierarchy. So I'm doing exactly what I'm commissioned to do. And if other people don't like it, well, I'll, there, there's a little box. You know, I, at my place in Michigan, you can go there and drop your little complaint into my box by the mailbox, and I'll get to it probably in three years from now. <laughs> See, that, that, that humor of mine, I know, it's one of the things that's keeping me humble in God's eyes, I guess. God allows these, these Italian sense of humor, this Italian sense of humor sometimes, too interrupt my my talk now to conclude i have one minute left i'll share with you a little joke since i'm joking now that i shared with some of the parishioners here when we would do after we had finished the stations of the cross yesterday jesus when he's crucified in the 12th station he's crucified between two thieves good and bad and i shared this little anecdote with some of you before so be patient if you've heard it already so I shared with him after the mass, after the stations, this man was dying and he called his son and asked his son to call in the doctor and lawyer and his son said, dad, you always said in life that they were never honest with you and that you didn't like them. Why now? He said, son, I'm dying. I want to make peace. So he calls this doctor and lawyer. When they get there, the father says, I want the doctor on my right side and the lawyer on my left. And then when they were there, he said, now I can die like our Lord between two thieves. Okay, bad joke, I understand, but I'm not in any way incriminating doctors or lawyers here, okay, because I'm a doctor. <laughs> but it's, if you have a good sense of humor, you get the pun, you get the joke. All right. May God bless you. May God keep you always joyful in this season. We're approaching Palm Sunday. And may you always unite yourself at the very first rising of the day to God's divine will before you even put your feet on the ground. Consecrate the whole day in thanksgiving to God and his divine will. And may God bless you and keep you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Reporting from Vatican City. The Catholic Church on Wednesday dismissed as false the miracles attributed to a statue of Virgin Mary in central Italy, which a self-professed visionary said had cried tears of blood. 54-year-old Sicilian Gisela Cardia had professed to communicate directly with the Virgin Mary and to have received the crucifixion wounds of Jesus Christ on her own body. Cardia, who was convicted in 2013 for fraudulent bankruptcy, founded a charity to help the sick funded by individual donors, some of whom later said they had been duped. Bishop Marco Salvi noted that the affair had not increased church participation, but in fact, had shaken the faith of many churchgoers, creating a scandalous situation. Mm -hmm.